where this woman by the name of Jesse Borelli was studies parental over control. Yeah, and this is actually p- p- parents being excessively controlling their, ch- their children has actually been studied since the 1930s. And what Borelli did a few years ago was she put she had these these kind of um, tweeners, like 12, 13 year old kids, um, <clears throat> in front of a computer game, and, and their mother was in the room. And the, the computer is, is kind of a computer puzzle. And it was harder than it looked to the point where it, got, it, get, it would get pretty frustrating because it's for kids to do. And the only instruction to the mother was, was don't help. And every single mom in the study, understandably, because watching your kids suffer, I mean, we're, we're, we're wired to, to help. We're wired to protect our kids. We're wired to soothe them. The mothers couldn't help. Uh, they couldn't re- refrain from helping. And what happened is they're, 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 there's heart, they're, they're both wearing a heart monitor. So when the mother helps, her heart rate goes way down because she, she has a sense of control. Now, I'm doing something, I'm, and, and I'm not sitting on my hands and zipping my lip. And, um, and the, But the kid's, kid's heart rate goes up. As mothers start to get involved, the kid gets more stressed. Hi, this is Danae. I'm the founder of Simple Families. Simple Families is an online community for parents who are seeking a simpler, more intentional life. In this show, we focus on minimalism with kids, positive parenting, family wellness, and decreasing the mental load. My perspectives are based in my firsthand experience raising kids, but also rooted in my PhD in child development. So you're going to hear conversations that are based in research, but more importantly, real life. Thanks for joining us. Hi there. Thanks so much for tuning in. Today, I have an interview with Dr. Bill Stixrud. I first remember hearing Dr. Stixrud's name almost 20 years ago when I was working my master's degree and doing some research. Dr. Stixrud is a best-selling author in conjunction with his co-author, Ned Johnson. He's also a neuropsychologist with decades of experience. He lectures widely on the developing brain, meditation, the effects of stress and sleep deprivation, technology overload. And I especially love his book, The Self-Driven Child, The Science and Sense of Giving Your Kids More Control of Their Lives. This book came out in 2019, and it's definitely on my must-read list for parents. After practicing for more than 40 years, Bill has seen a lot of trends come and go. He's seen the pendulum swing back and forth when it comes to parenting and raising kids. As a result, his voice is such a breath of fresh air. In our chat today, we're talking about helping kids to develop an inner drive and to take control of their own lives. Bill is also an advocate for something he calls radical downtime, which absolutely jives with Simple Families and our mission here. Of course, we're going to tackle screen time and how to navigate it. I hope you enjoy my chat with him. It was such an honor to be able to pick his brain on these topics that are so near and dear to my heart and that he's been writing and learning about for so much longer than I have. Thanks for tuning in. Hi, Bill. How are you? I'm great, Danae. How are you? I'm great. So I was thinking about the question, if you could have dinner with anybody and pick their brain, who would it be? And you're on my list. I'm so happy to be talking with you today. I'm honored. Yeah. Well, I had first heard your name probably almost 20 years ago when I was doing my master's degree in DC, which is where you most of your work is centered, right? Yes. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your career. Well, <laughs> after flunking out of graduate school in English wow. and then and then failing as a teacher because I couldn't maintain a classroom, I got lucky and I, I found a way to, to work with kids that um, I can do it one-on-one. And so uh, I, I got training in, as a school psychologist and then have worked as a neuropsychologist since 1984. Um, and since that time, I've made a living by testing kids who... Have, if they're having learning problems or attention problems, or, or they may have autism or emotional problems, and I try to figure out what's going well, what's not going well, and how to help them. And I love doing it. That's amazing. Yeah. And in the process, you're kind of like opening up the brain to figure out what's going on in there and to better understand all of the ins and outs, right? Well, that's the cool. Yeah. I mean, neuropsychology, the, the neuropsychological assessments in some ways are not all that different from like a really comprehensive psychoeducational assessment. It's just that neuropsychologists are trained in kind of how the, how the brain operates, how it's organized. So you, it, it just allows you to make some hypotheses about things. Well, if this is weak, we, we got to check over here. It's just kind of a nice model. Um, and just n- knowing, so, I mean, I, there, there's a few things to know about their brain that are just so helpful. I mean, and, uh, 
that, 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 that um, and a lot of neuropsychologists don't, don't emphasize them, but because I've, because I've been writing and, and lecturing about other stuff, there, there's probably three or four things about the brain that are just, are just life-changing to know. Yeah. Can you share a couple with us just to start yeah. us out? Well, the first thing for parents to know is this, that the prefrontal cortex of the brain, which is the most recently evolved part of the brain, that it's, it's right behind your forehead. And it does all the, anything that requires thinking and planning, anything that's goal-directed, that's not just instinctual, requires involvement of the prefrontal cortex. And so the first thing to know is that the prefrontal cortex is extremely slow to, to, to develop. And, and the cognitive functions, which include things like planning and organizing and holding things in a working memory and, 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 and evaluating things, your, your prefrontal cortex can think logically, can think clearly, can calm you down when you start to get upset. The, the cognitive functions aren't mature till 25 plus minus three. And the emotional regulation functions in terms of you know, managing your emotions aren't mature until 32 plus minus three. Mm. So when I learned this, basically I learned this in 1992 and it's been of enormous help to the thousands of parents really, but my telling them that your kid don't, you don't have to worry your kid's going to get stuck in this negative place. They're, they're going to have a completely different brain in two years and two years after that. And it's been the most encouraging thing that I've ever learned. And the other, the other thing is that when you're in your, and we talk a lot, that, uh, we talk about this a lot in, in both our books, including our new book, but um, the idea that when you're in your right mind, meaning when you're, when you're, when you're goal directed, you're purposeful, you're involved and you aren't in your, you're kind of in the present, you aren't overly anxious and you aren't exhausted. Your prefrontal cortex regulates the rest of the brain and kind of just can modulate. So, so you start to get upset, something stressful happens, your prefrontal cortex activates and you go into coping mode. You cope with it so you don't get really, really upset. And when you're too tired or you're too stressed, your prefrontal cortex doesn't work to do that. And your stress response <laughs> runs the rest of your brain. So you, you, go, you just go into kind of panic mode. But um, I, I think that, um, that, that I was at a wedding then a, um, a few years ago, and one of my best friends came up to me and said that learning how slow the prefrontal cortex development just gave me so, develops, gave me so much hope. And by the end of the conversation, five other friends had come up and said exactly the same thing. Yeah. 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 Well, because we all want our kids to be able to, you know, quote unquote, control their emotions from a young age. And I think part of that, you know, as a parent, I have a six and eight year old. Part of that comes from the fact that when my kids lose it, you know, and they hit the red zone. I feel like there's some ounce of my responsibility in there. Like, what did I miss? What should I be doing? How can I make this better? And sometimes when our kids have a hard time controlling their emotions, we can kind of personalize it as parents. I think that's right. And I think that certainly there, there, that if we change our steps, I mean, a lot, we talk about the, a lot in our new book. If we change our steps, I mean, kids, kids tend to respond, but it doesn't mean that we're responsible for their feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and some kids, you know, that, that uh, some kids are really hard to stress. You know, some, some kids have a much more sensitive stress response and are more easily stressed and are more likely to feel kind of overwhelmed when the prefrontal cortex goes offline and, and they're just kind of run by their emotions. Yeah. And, and, and we need to be patient. You know, we can certainly teach them some skills, but part of it is just waiting patiently uh, for, for that prefrontal cortex, to, to, which, which regulates mm -hmm. and, and, and puts things in perspective. And that's not, it can tell you that's not, it says, that's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. But um, so, yeah, yeah. It's some kids, I mean, some, <laughs> some kids are easier than others. I mean, my, my, and all of our, all of our fear, I, mean, th I, I realized this years ago when I used to do a lot of psychotherapy, all of our fear about our kids, all of our anxiety about our kids. It's about the future in the sense that we worry that they're going to get stuck in some negative place and, and it's going to get worse. And I, I learned, I saw this particularly when my daughter was just turning two and she started to stutter and, and it got bad. And for, after a couple of weeks, she didn't want to talk. And I thought, and I, I've never been more panicked in my life than that. I, I thought, how could this ever get better? She, she won't talk. Yeah. And, and a couple of days later, she just started talking normally. I've said something developmentally shifted. She started talking normally. But I realized that all my, all my anxiety was about she's going to get stuck. It's about the future. Cause, and I tell parents you know, that I've seen, if I can tell a parent, I've seen 5,000 kids like your kid, who's, who's kind of a mess at this age, who've turned out really good. You just don't have to worry so much. That it, it, it helps because th that, th that the worry is all about the future. And I just said, so kids going through a hard place, okay, that's part of their path. 
I, I, I respect that as part of their path. I want to help them, but I, I don't feel badly about it. I, I'm not worried they're going to get stuck there. That's just part of their path. Yeah. Well, most parents, I think when they come to your office, what they're desperately looking for is for you to say, everything's fine. You know, you're, you're fine. Everything's okay. And do you find that? I, I, that's how I felt the first time I went to a neurologist's office. <laughs> well, it's it's mixed. I mean, the, the, there's some kids, there's some parents that go, "What's wrong with this kid?" You know, I know there's I know there's something wrong. You know, uh, yeah. that they want. They, why is he? Why? Yeah. Why is he acting like this? You know, yeah. Why is him? Why is this so hard? Um, some some parents are, are don't don't want you know just want to hear that everything's fine. But but most of them don't spend the don't want to spend the money for a neurocycle unless they think that there's something going on. Yeah. You know, and, and when they call my office, unless they really, unless we think there's something going on, we we, we say don't spend the money. You know yeah. that. Uh, so, but yeah, and I I think that, and and my my angle, is that even if kids have problems, that's okay too. Yeah. And I say that because, you know, I can't predict the future. There's no evidence that they weren't supposed to have this problem, and so I, I assume that that's part of kind of part of their life, right now. And also, I don't want kids to feel sorry for themselves. When I used to do th- therapy, I, sometimes I'd see kids who were really just did, engaged in a lot of self pity, and I never once saw it help. Mm-hmm. And so I determined I'm not. I don't want them to feel sorry for themselves, so I'm not going to feel sorry for them. Yeah. You know, I, I think we tend to feel, and understandably, I, we feel badly for our kids if they aren't doing well, they're struggling in some way. But I think that 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 when our kids are not doing well. 90% of our work is on ourselves. It's really on managing our own fear, our anxiety, our own anger, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and I'm holding on to what you just said, which was when kids have problems. And I mean, I think I know what you meant by that. But then I also think that as parents, we need to come to this reality that all kids have problems and they're going to have problems as they grow. And we can't fix all those problems, nor can we anticipate them all. Well, it's true. And, and the way that kids become resilient is is they deal with stuff and and you know I've I've got I've got a daughter who just sailed through school, and it's who's forty and a very successful economist and his son who had a lot of learning issues and had tics and 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 tension problems, needed a lot of help. And he's got a PhD uh, working with top executives at one of the largest corporations in the world. You know and 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 nobody who knew him when he was when he, even in high school would have predicted that he. Yeah, but he's just, and it came out of him. Um, and so I just think that you're right. I mean, the, the, the only, I, I've, I've tested two kids in 40 years who were above the 90th percentile in every test I gave them, and they were so screwed up. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, when I test kids, I say, I hope I find stuff that you suck at because yeah. people who, successful people, they find ways to use what they're naturally good at, they work really hard at it. And then they find a way to serve the world, um, you know. And uh, so, and people don't have to be equally good at everything. Most people don't become develop successful lives by always doing well and never stumbling and you know, ne- mm-hmm. never having any problems. And the way you become resilient, the way the brain develops that re- that that ability to to handle stress and go into coping mode as opposed to freaking out, is something stressful happens and you cope with it. You, pre- you, you cope with it skillful with support if, you, if necessary, but you cope with it and you have that experience. I can control stressful situations. I can manage stressful situations. That's how you develop resilience and high stress tolerance and confidence in your ability to handle stressful stuff is by doing it. Yeah. So it's okay. Yeah, absolutely. And that really inspired a lot of your work, your written work and this book, The Self-Driven Child, which yeah. you know was a bestseller, you know, been read all over the world. And I, I, I mean, I think this message within your book and your work really aligns well with simple families in that, you know, less is more sometimes. And as parents, we want to, you know, drive our kids and push our kids to be better. But your research shows that maybe that's not what our approach needs to be. Oh, well, <laughs> anybody who thinks that the best way for kids to develop is to be pushed all the time. So to maximize the potential, it does, just doesn't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Uh, and you know the, the 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 optimal environment for kids to learn, the, op- the optimal internal state, is relaxed alertness. You know, you, you aren't you aren't tired. You, you're you're focused, but you aren't highly stressed. Mm. And and most of the kids that I see are most of the time they're, they're tired and they're stressed. You know, it's just you know. And and so the idea the kids need to be more and more. I mean, just look at homework. I mean, th- that in 1986. 
Uh, I, I, I did, um, I wrote a couple of papers on homework and I researched, what do we know about how homework's contribution to learning? And I was stunned to learn in 1986 that after 60 years of research, no one had demonstrated that homework contributes to learning at all in elementary school and, and in, in middle school and high school, very little. And so I actually, I, I wrote an article um, on how not to fight with your kid about homework. And that's where I came up with the line that's, that's actually the second chapter in The Self-Driven Child, the title of the second chapter, which is, I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. You know, something that doesn't seem to, well, why, it's not that important. I just, you're, you're much more important to me than your schoolwork is. Mm-hmm. And, and so, yeah, the, the idea that, that, more, that more homework or more, more extracurriculars or, uh, and we work, we, we, we do best when we're well rested, we aren't highly stressed, and we're pursuing things that we really care about. That, that's, what, that's when the brain really works well. And so, yeah, and, and I mean, there's a reason that kids from really high, highly affluent families and high, with really expensive, high achieving schools are at much higher risk for depression and anxiety disorders and self abuse and self cutting and substance abuse than middle class kids are. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, 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 that. The people, it is so striking. I was just, I was just in um, uh, this very wealthy community in a suburb of Chicago where they have huge incidents of, of mental health problems and suicides and stuff. These kids who have everything. The, the, one of the superintendents said, the community is so wealthy that kids just leave the expensive bikes out on, on the lawn. Nobody steals them. The major problem is that the police report is, is domestic violence. So the idea that just having more and more and more is what brings you f- fulfillment is, is just not true. Yeah. And part of the reason you wrote The Self-Driven Child was because you were seeing more and more capable kids coming into your office that were stressed and unmotivated. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think even before COVID, Danae, that, that, that uh, you know, people were saying that, that we had really had seen unprecedented levels of stress-related mental health problems. And, and frankly, all mental, re- mental health problems are stress-related. They're all related to a kind of disordered stress response where the, pre- the prefrontal cortex isn't regulating that, that stress response. And, and so uh, we, that we've seen these very high levels of anxiety and depression. And, and, and Ned, my co-author, Ned Johnson, and I knew that this has to be related to a low sense of control because a low sense of control is the most stressful thing you can experience. Yeah. And, and so we thought all these mental health problems related to a low sense of control. We also, he, we noticed that so many of the kids that we work with, I see a lot of kids with learning disabilities or ADHD, bad anxiety problems. They, they kind of avoid their schoolwork. And so they just aren't motivated to work very hard. And, and Ned sees a lot of kids. He's an SAT prep guy. And he, he sees a lot of kids who are just, just obsessively driven, perfectionistic. That's not healthy either. And so we, we realized every place we look to understand how did kids become self-motivated? It was through autonomy, the sense that this is my life. And, and so we thought this must, this is, if, if autonomy or sense of control is the key to mental health and it's the key to, to motivation, this must be a really big deal. So that, that's kind of why we wrote this book about the importance of giving kids more control over their own lives. Yeah. You know, I recently had a client say to me this quote, which I hadn't heard, but I've been thinking about. And um, they said, strict parents raise sneaky kids. That's great. Think about that. Yeah, certainly. We we know that punishment is not an effective parenting tool because it it, it can get kids to stop doing stuff right right now, but they, but they sneak it. They do. They, they, they sneak it. (laughs) Uh, And, and it's just, you know, being strict, we, we know, I mean, there, there's been at least 60 years of research on parenting styles. And at least in the Western world, we know that works, what works best is what they call authoritative parent, not authoritarian, not my, 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 my way of the highway, buddy, because I said so. Yeah. That doesn't work. That, 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 that doesn't produce the kind of kids who are flexible, who, who are good problem solvers, who are emotionally well-regulated, um, who are motivated. And it also just kind of whatever you want to do, kid, that's fine. That, does, that laissez-faire doesn't work either. It's that authority. We're, 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 as, as we're older, we're bigger. We just, we have natural authority. And, but, but, but we're respectful to the kids. And we realize they have minds of their own. And we realize, I don't always know what's in their best interest. And I want them to figure out, kind of what, what, to pay attention to what, what works for them, what, what, what makes them happy. Look, as they get older, what kind of life do they want? We just talked to 2,000 high school kids. The talk was creating a life that you want. 
mm-hmm. because young people grew up thinking in, in a lot of these areas that we work with, all, actually all over the world, they grew up thinking that the most important outcome of their whole childhood and adolescence is, 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 is where they go to college. And so many people, these kids, they, they get into the most elite colleges and they're still friggin' miserable. And they realize that that wasn't it. Mm-hmm. And we want them to think about creating a life that, that they really want. That they, and we want them to, to pursue success in a way that's sustainable as opposed to these incredibly like burnout kind of schedules that so many young people do. Yeah. Yeah. You said in your book that kids shouldn't feel like an empty extension of their parents. Well, th- th- you know, certainly I mean, anybody who has a child right. n- knows that, that, that they got a mind of their own. You know, yeah. you, you can't make them eat. You can't make them sleep even as infants. You know, mm-hmm. that, and if you have two kids, you realize how, how different you know, they are, and and so we're big fans of respecting that kind of that, that kind of individuality, and we want people to, we want people to be good teammates and, and good family members, but and good citizens, but we also w- w- want to appreciate the fact that that, that 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 you're the expert on you, really, and, and I want you to have a life that you want, and I and as I get older today, the, the, I'm I'm seventy two, and the older I get, the more humble I get about knowing what's in a kid's best interest. Yeah. Because so often when something thing that's apparently that seems bad happens, it leads to something really good that was unanticipated. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I, and so part, part of our emphasis, you know, we, we, we talk in the self-driven child about parents as, they get, as kids get older, thinking about themselves more as consultants to their kids rather than the kid's boss or manager or the homework police. Where the idea is that, we want to help kids eventually run their own life before they leave home. That, that's, we think that should be our goal as parents, is to help our kids learn how to run their own life before they leave home. So that doesn't mean continually managing and staying on top of their schoolwork or cutting off the internet at 12 o'clock every night or uh, fighting with them all the time about, about sleep. It, it, it means helping them figure out what works for them um, before the, so that they, they become independent. And, and, and the implications of this are that we offer help and advice. We don't try to force it. We encourage kids to make their own decisions and require older teenagers to make the most important decision about their own life. We want them to practice making important decisions. Mm-hmm. And as much as possible, as I said earlier, we let kids solve their own problems because that's what changes the brain in a way that makes kids copers as opposed mm-hmm. to panickers. Yes, yes. I love Ross Green's CPS model for this. Are you familiar? Yeah, we, we use the collaborative problem solving uh, a, a lot in our work. Um, yeah. And I think that, and it's so interesting to me that, because when you talk about the, the, the strict parents and icky kids, mm-hmm. you know, Ross Green, I think, became famous um, because he, he's, he was working with these really extremely uh, resistant, defiant, emotionally rigid, emotionally explosive kids. And he realized you, know, you can't make them do stuff. And, and one, of the, one of the things he says is that, you, that he recommends saying to re- the most resistant, rigid kid is, I'm not going to try to use the force of my will to make you do things. Hmm. And then so we talk, when problems come up, rather than dealing with them in the moment, which we, we, kind of, we, we, we do them as best we can, but rather than lecturing or you're, you're grounded for two weeks, we come back and talk about it when we're calm in this collaborative problem-solving way yeah. that always starts with empathy. We always start expressing, which is which is empathy is the. We talk about this in our new book. Empathy is the tool, really, for building connection with kids. Mm-hmm. And so, all the collaborative problem comes up. We start the next morning. We say that, that I know that this happened. I, I know you. I, I know that this is really important to you, and I can understand why you're really frustrated. And then, then express your your point of view and say, how can we work this out together? And I I, I love that. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of, I had this moment when my, um, so my first child was a, a rule follower, always did everything by the books. So as a result, I felt very in control um, <laughs> because, you know, I was yeah, this parent who had yeah, the kid yeah. that was supposed to do all the things they were supposed to do and, you know, told him to do something and he did it. And um, then my second child came along and humbled me. Um, so I had a, a kind of a profound moment with her when she was about, I would say about two, maybe getting close to two and a half. And she decided she didn't want to get in the car seat anymore. And that was when I really had this reckoning of, I cannot control you, (laughs) right? Because I couldn't physically put her into the car seat when she didn't want to get into the car seat. And that, that real physical will that she started to exert that I saw very clearly that, oh, 
this is what this is what they mean when you say you can't really control your kids. I get yeah. it now. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I look at kind of the generation that I was raised in and a lot of my parents, uh, my peers' parents, they used a lot of fear to get control. And that was something that worked pretty effectively, right? There was this fear, like, if you don't do this, then your parents could they could potentially hit you, right? There's sort of this fear of physical punishment. And we don't have that anymore in our generation as it's become, fortunately, you know, out of out of what we do within our parenting methods right. um, for most of us. Yeah. And we don't have that fear that we sort of dangle over our kids. So, you know, I think that our sense of control feels less without that. I don't know. What do you think? You've kind of seen the shift over the years. No, right. And I think that um, for one thing, I mean, as, as, I, as I alluded to earlier, um, you know, certainly spanking kind of strict forms of punishment, they just aren't very effective. There, there's much more effective ways to, to, to get kids to comply, to, to, to help kids be, to develop, be, to develop a conscience, to, be, to, be, to, to, to respect rules. Um, and so it's not necessary. And it certainly was easier because if, if what I said is, before is true, that a low sense of control is the most stressful thing to experience, how stressful is it for a parent to trying to get their kid to do something and not being able to do it? Yeah. And part of what we part of part of the point that we make in the self-driven child is that once you make peace with the fact that I really can't make my kid do anything, it gets a lot easier. You stop trying to get them to, to, to make them do things. And you take you start to use more skillful ways. And you really start to get to, to, to I, I don't want power of my kids, I want influence. So you work on your relationship. And you spend an hour I, ideally I, I want parents to spend an hour a week one on one with a kid. There's, there's probably nothing that, that makes you feel closer to somebody than being alone with them, where you really get to know them. And so much of, of kids' motivation to go along with us is, is our relationship with them. And I think if we use harsh forms of discipline, we do use a lot of, a lot of criticism, that really hurts our relationship to the point where they, they're just not that motivated to go along with us. Yeah, uh, you know, when you try to get her to the car seat and, and she's strong enough, now you can't do it. You get, you got, you got you to gotta go to Plan B. You know? right. yeah. <laughs> but but there are better ways, and but certainly, um, really, there's a, we talk about in our new book. It's a really interesting study where this woman by the name of Jesse Borelli was studies parental over control, yeah, and this is actually p- p- parents being excessively controlling their, ch- their children has actually been studied since the 1930s. And what Borelli did a few years ago was she put she had these these kind of um, tweeners, like 12, 13 year old kids, um, <clears throat> in front of a computer game, and, and their mother was in the room. And the, the computer is is kind of a computer puzzle, and it was harder than it looked to the point where it, got, it, get, it would get pretty frustrating because it, it, for kids to do. And the only instruction to the mother was, was don't help. And every single mom in the study, understandably, because watching your kids suffer, I mean, we're, we're, we're wired to, to help. We're wired to protect our kids. We're wired to soothe them. The mothers couldn't help. Uh, they couldn't re- refrain from helping. And what happened is they're, 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 there's heart, they're, they're both wearing a heart monitor. So when the mother helps, her heart rate goes way down because she, she has a sense of control. Now I'm doing something I'm, and, and I'm not sitting on my hands and zipping my lip. And, um, and the, but the kids, 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 heart rate goes up as mothers start to get involved, the kid gets more stressed. And so, uh, it's the, we, in our new book, we really talk about how th- this challenge of, if, if we really say, okay, I'm going to be your consultant, I'm going to let you make a decision. We got to sit on our hands a lot more than we ever had before. And we've got to zip our lip a lot more than we do. And it's really stressful. That's and so, so the, hard. I, I know <laughs> that's, that, that, so hard. that's why I say most of the work. <laughs> Is on, I'm, you know, I, I, I saw enough kids when I used to do therapy who said, you know, my dad got, I, my dad was yelling at me last night for yelling at my brother. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, maybe there's logic in there, but I'm not fighting it. You know, <laughs> I really, there's much of our work is, is, is on ourselves. And in both of our yeah. books, we talk about ideally because systems, whether it's a family or a corporation or a school, they work better if the, if the leaders are not are, are can be a non anxious presence, not highly anxious and overly overly reactive, emotionally reactive, and so we we encourage parents and, and and have a device for parents to move in that direction of seeing themselves as a non anxious presence in the family, 
if you know, kids if kids are stressed because you know, problems, we don't we don't have to panic or freak, get us get upset as they do. We, we can be that calm, non, that, that, that we can we can go into problem solving mode with them. We, we can we listen respectfully. We can use a reflective reflective listening. Like the, what, what I got from you saying, it sounds to me like you're, you're really frightened. That kind of thing. we can do that kind of thing. Uh, but we can't do that if, if we get stressed, and because stress is contagious. If, if, if we're stressed, our kid picks it up. And if our kid's stressed, we pick it up. And th- that, that's, that's why it's so hard. If a, kid's, if a kid gets mad at us, it's so hard to, to, to stay calm because our stress response gets triggered by the anger in the other kid. And we start, and then we can't think straight and we start yelling or raising our voice or whatever. Um, and so, but I, I think if we have this goal, that, that we have this idea that part of my responsibility is to work on myself is to manage my own emotions, to work on my own stress, to get, get my, stay enough well-rested so I can be present and I can be relatively calm um, and I, I can move in this direction of being a non-anxious presence. Then I can be less controlling my kid. I can give my kid more autonomy um, and, st- and, and feel just a little bit more at ease sitting on my hands and zipping my lip. We're gonna pause for a three minute word from today's sponsors. The first sponsor for today is Native. I'm so thrilled to have Native back as a sponsor for the podcast. I have been a very long time user, as has my husband. We have both tried many, many types of deodorants made with natural ingredients. Most have failed, but Native comes through for us time and time again. You probably know Native from their aluminum-free deodorant. They keep their list pretty bare. Ingredients like coconut oil, shea butter, baking soda, but they also make sure it does everything it says it's gonna do. Native also offers a variety of scents with special new and limited edition scents being released all the time. I'm especially excited about the new toasted marshmallow and vanilla. Smell and feel fresh all day long with Native. Get 20% off your first order by going to nativedo.com families or use the promo code families at checkout. That's nativedeo.com slash families, or use the promo code families at checkout for 20% off your first order. Trust me, I've shopped around, and this is absolutely where you can get the best deal. Our second sponsor for today is Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. You don't have to spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills. You can do it all with Indeed. Hiring can be intimidating. It's a process that feels so multifaceted, which is why I'm thankful that Indeed makes it simple. They have so many great features like screenings and assessments. With screening and assessments, they help star applicants shine before the interview even starts. With over 135 graded assessment tests that they can take, anything from cooking to coding. So join over 3 million businesses worldwide using Indeed to hire great talent fast. Indeed knows that when you're growing your business, you have to make every dollar count which is why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Visit indeed.com slash families to start hiring now. Just go to indeed.com slash families. Indeed.com slash families. Terms and conditions do apply. Our third and final sponsor for today is Seed. It turns out everything you know about probiotics may be wrong. Yes, probiotic tortilla chips sounded way too good to be true. Seed's daily symbiotic is the real deal. It's a two-in-one probiotic and prebiotic with a capsule in capsule design, which, which means there's one little capsule inside of a bigger capsule, which protects against stomach acid, digestive enzymes, and bile salts for viability all the way through digestion. That means the live probiotics are actually gonna make it to the end of your small intestine for delivery into the colon. If you've taken a probiotic before and you didn't feel a difference, it's likely because the good bacteria wasn't making it all the way through your GI tract. Seed is designed differently and that's why it works. After trying it myself, everyone in my family takes it now. Start a new healthy habit today. Visit seed.com forward slash simple. Use the code simple to redeem 20% off your first month of Seed's DS1 Daily Symbiotic. That's seed.com forward slash simple and use the code simple. Thanks so much for supporting our sponsors. Back to our chat. 
I um, So my dissertation research was on feeding children, so looking at the parental approach to feeding children. And um, so I knew a lot about feeding children before I had children. Mm -hmm. And then um, one of the choices that we made early on was when our kids started solids that we used something called baby led weaning, which was basically you put the foods in front of the children instead of spoon feeding them purees, they fed themselves. And I, that this, the study that you just explained to me really feels very familiar because I actually had to sit on the opposite side of the table. Oh, wow. I I couldn't just sit next to my child and let them feed themselves because I had such a tendency to get my hands in there and just want to do it. And I literally had to give myself physical space so that I didn't do it. (laughs) Well, I, I I know it's, it's hard. And, and, it, it it works. I mean, yeah, if you can if you can do it, works. You know, <laughs> well, there's there's a woman who um, I, I've tested all of her, all four of her kids and followed them for years. And and Ned did ACT or SAT prep for all four kids and, and uh, GRE prep for a couple of them. And um, so we've known this family for years. And the mother is one of the most wonderful. She's wonderful. She's one of the most. She's brilliant. She's generous. She's the most kindest person. And, and she's also was very controlling. She, she's such a great manager, yeah. but she's kind of really micromanaged her, her kids. And one of her, her, her youngest kid, uh, I tested when he was 15, and was, was really struggling, really struggling. And she read The Self-Driven Child, and she really loves Ned and me, and she trusted us. She said, okay, I'm going to commit myself to this. So she had to get a job to kind of distract herself. And she stopped looking at his report. Or she stopped checking his grade. She said, really, and she said, and, and she said, she sent us a, a, an email a couple years later and said that he was just accepted the National Honor Society, and, and his teacher said he's amazing, and this is so different than when I saw him when he was in fifteen, and he, got, he was a straight A student at uh, freshman college, and um, it's not that you have to be a straight A student, but I'm just saying that she found that, that even though it's hard, even though we have to really we have to really work on our disciplining ourselves. That when we do it, it's just so good for kids. It's so good, so good for kids to feel trusted. I felt my whole career that, especially for teenagers, the best message you can give them, besides I'm crazy about you, is I have confidence in your ability to make decisions about your own life and to learn from your mistakes. And I want you to have a ton of experience doing that before I send you off to, to college or wherever you go. And with little kids, we can say, you're the expert on you. No one knows you really better than anybody else. And so that, and I care about your opinion. Sometimes we do things we don't, we don't like, but I don't want you to always have to do stuff you don't like. You know, and so, we, and the things that certainly our limit, the limits of our control become pretty clear when we try to get kids to sleep. Mm, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and our, one of the chapters in our new book, it, it's, called, um, uh, it's called The Hard Ones, talking with kids about sleep and technology. And they're the, they're hard ones because because especially as kids get older, they, 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 these are the ones they fight you on the most. You know, I, I don't need as much sleep. I don't, I'm I'm not tired. You know, it's technology. I can play ten hours a day. It doesn't doesn't affect me. You know, they, they just uh, it can be hard. And our angle is that because you can't make a kid sleep, and because you don't want to fight constantly about the same thing over and over again, it's just toxic. So what we want to do in both cases is is take that consultative role to help kids figure out. How to set limits themselves in the technology? What, how much is too much? What, what if, if you play five hours a day? How does it affect? Let's see. How that, well, if you want to play, let's try it for a week. See how it goes, and then we'll, we'll negotiate. We'll do the collaborative problem solve. Because I can't, I couldn't live with myself if you're, if you're, if you're playing games six hours a day. I, I can't, that's not going to happen. But we got. We'll find. I, I want, but I want you to enjoy it. I know how much how important it is to you. Mm-hmm. So like that. So we negotiate. We model. I can't tell you how many families I've worked with. The majority of kids that I see, because I see a lot of kids with ADHD and anxiety disorders, they have sleep problems. And so as they get older, a lot of arguments about getting getting good bedtime. And and I ask the parents, how do you sleep? And so often they say, I have terrible insomnia. And I said, well, rather than fighting constantly, why don't we say, let's have a family meeting and say, Mm -hmm. let's support each other and get enough rest. You know, I, I have insomnia. It's really hard for me. And, and I, if you can help me, if you have any ideas, I, I welcome it to your kids. You know, I'd love for you to be in bed by, by, by 10. I think it'd be so much better for you. But I, I, I can't make you fall asleep. And you can't make yourself fall asleep. You know, but I think that, that this kind of discussion, that this consultative kind of idea is really life transforming. And it, it's not easy. In fact, <laughs> right, it's certainly after The Soft Open Child was published, one of my clients emailed me and she said, my eighth grade son 
just this uh, I just told my eighth grade son, I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. And first he smiled and then he hugged me and they said, is something wrong with you, mom? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's a change yeah. from, from thinking that somehow we're supposed to know who our kids are supposed to be. We're, we're responsible for making them turn out a certain way. And that idea is very humbling. We yeah. started back in the spring um, trying to kind of get a handle on the screen time coming out of the pandemic yep. because everybody in the house had had this sort of slowly inching up amount of screen time that sure. felt out of control. Yeah. So in March, we started um, kind of experimenting with cutting back um, by my husband and I starting first. And we started locking up our devices with a, a safe where you set a timer on it. and. Um, it just, it felt like we had to lead by example, right? Like we had to get a grip first before we could ask anybody else to. And it was terrifying, right? Locking up your phone. We did 60 hours once um, and really just having to sit with our, ourselves and get comfortable with that was just this fascinating experience. And um, it's kind of changed the way screens have been in our house ever since. That's brilliant. I, I'm so glad you told me that today. I, I, I've never heard of anybody doing that. And it, but there's a study that was done in England about ten years ago, where, where parents were asked, uh, "Do your kids spend too much time on, on, on in front of a screen?" And sixty percent of parents—I mean, I'm sure it'd be more now—but sixty percent of the parents said yes, they, they do. Seventy percent of the kids said my parents spend too much time. On the screen. Oh, yeah. and, and so the, the idea of the, the, the modeling the, the, that I'm, I'm, I'm doing this for myself, and, and so and kids are so, especially as they get older, they're such a, they're so aware of hypocrisy. Yeah, um, in, in in other people and particularly in their parents, um, that's a really wonderful idea. It's interesting though because I do feel like as parents we can justify all of our tech use as being you know it's work right. This is what puts a roof over your head, <laughs> um, but it's we're still demonstrating the lack of limits regardless of what we're doing on our phones. Right. Being unable to put them down shows a lack of being able to set boundaries on your own use, which is what we're really asking our kids to do. Right. Right. I, I I want kids to know that there's <laughs> for teenagers. I I, I want them to to, to watch uh, that Netflix documentary um, uh, on social media with, with oh, the uh, social dilemma. The social dilemma. Have you seen it? Yeah. Uh, you know I have not because it, I know it would be terrifying. <laughs> I've actually well, avoided no, watching it. <laughs> it. It just it just lets young people know how yeah. they're being played by by these be, be, uh, by, by the social media companies. I just how how manipulative they're how, how manipulative and, yeah. and and young people don't like to be played. And with little kids, younger kids, what I tell them is that, you know, 200 psychologists in 2018, 200 psychologists signed a letter to the, the president of the American Psychological Association asking them to condemn the psychologists who are working in Silicon Valley, knowingly creating video games and, 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 and other products. They're as, they're as addictive as possible. They're using mm-hmm. psychological and motivational techniques yeah. and behavioral techniques that, to, that they know will make these as addictive as possible. That's what we're up against. That's why it's so hard for you to put this stuff down because it, it's, it's supposed to be addicting. Yeah. Uh, and I think if we, if we have these kind of honest discussions with kids and also with, with technology, what we find is that most kids experience the, 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 the energy coming to their parents regarding their technology use, whether, whether it's social media or video games, is get off, get off, shut it down, shut it down, shut it down, shut it down. One of the things we're talking about in our new book is, did you know motivational interviewing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we, we have a chapter in a new book called The Language and Silence of Change, where we talk about the idea that you really can't change somebody. against If you try to change somebody against their will, you, all you get is conflict and resistance. But there's a very effective ways of helping people change that don't involve trying to change them. And one is this thing called motivational interviewing, where you ask people to... Um, basically you ask open-ended questions of people, including your kids. And you know, and we, we asked, for example, so, so example, t- t- tell me what, what, what you get out of playing video games. What, what, what are they like for you? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to talk you out of it. I'm, I just, just want to understand. And we use that reflective listening to let them know. I'm, I'm, so what, what you love about it, the video games is you love the challenge. You, you, you love the way it feels when you actually, when you win a game or you, 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 you don't die and, or you're connecting with your friends and we're, we, we express empathy and, we, and appreciation. This is really cool because one of the, one of the key insights of motivational interviewing is that people are ambivalent about change. They're ambivalent. So, so we're in this public high school 
And we asked about 2,000 kids, how many of you use your phones more than you should? Every single kid raised their hand. They know. Wow. They know. But, but, but the more that we preach with them, that if all the energy from us is coming on not understanding and, 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 and empathy, uh, but it's all no, 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 then they argued the other side of their ambivalence. You see, so um, we want we want to do is show is show interest. If you got little kids and they're and they're and, and they're not, I don't I, hopefully they're not the little kid that it, anybody before five doesn't. There's nothing technology doesn't nothing for them. Uh, um, and what they need to do is play. Mm-hmm. Um, and even older kids need, need, need the, the most important thing is that they play. Um, but a, a, if you introduce video games to them, for example, then uh, play with them you know, and show interest. And in the same way that it's baseball. Because th- then you can influence them so much more easily than if you're just trying to control them. Just, and if all the energy is no, 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 that it's, it's much more effective. Yeah, absolutely. So I gave a parent talk on Friday and I introduced the idea of radical downtime and from your book. And I found it fascinating. I explained what it was and why it's important. And then afterwards, I had a couple of parents come up to me and say, tell me more about radical downtime. How do you do it? <laughs> And I think there's such a, you know, such a catch 22 in that question is that how do we do radical downtime, which should be such a simple thing. So tell us about radical downtime. Well, it's just a phrase that I made up because it just seemed to me that, you know, ever since the, that, ever since the advent of the electric light, you know, that adults slept, sleep somewhere two and three hours less than they did before that. Mm -hmm. And so, so technology has just encroached increasingly on our, our rest. And the, the, the ancient Vedic tradition in India taught that, that life proceeds, in, uh, on, it's, it's a delicate, it's a balance of rest and activity. And, and, and our assumption right now is that, that the, the balance is way out of whack between activity and rest. We're, we're, I mean, kids don't nap in, in kindergarten anymore. You know, they're, they're really, and uh, and, and we, the kids sleep much less than they used to even 30 years ago. Um, and so the idea is because we're all so friggin' tired, and so we're, we're also active and stimulated all the time, we need more radical downtime. Because you know, 20 years ago, people would say, well, my, my downtime is playing golf, or my, 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 golf, my, my good downtime is gardening. And those things are great. I'm all for them. Uh, but the, the, what we're saying, radical downtime is where it looks like you're doing nothing. When actually, what you're do, really doing is restoring your, your your brain and your body. And so, the, the three things that we, we we include under that category of radical downtime are just daydreaming, where you know you, 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 because kids need time to reflect on themselves. And we know that there's a huge uh, that that just that having time to be in your own head hugely related to creativity and to problem solving. So you need time where you don't have your headphones in, you aren't listening, you aren't you aren't focused on a task where you're just in your own head. That's where a lot of creative solutions come up. That, that, that's where it's good creative ideas and problem solutions come. So it, it's that it's that um, kind of unfocused uh, mind wandering, and it's it's sleep, and you, you could not you could not possibly overemphasize how important sleep is uh, for for everything. And the third is meditation. And my co-author and I, I, I practiced transcendental meditation for almost 50 years, my, my uh, twice a day, never missed. And my, my co-author um, practices uh, 10 years. And, you know, we're respectful of, of all kinds of meditation. I just, we just happen to know TM the best. Um, and so we, we talk about the, the, the value of, of, of every day, and ideally twice a day, deeply relaxing your mind and your body. Because as, as my co-author likes to say, if the inflows of stress, the stress we take on from our daily living, it exceeds the outflows, the kind of the, the, the stress that we throw off through exercise or sleep or whatever, we just build up more and more stress. And we know that ain't good for you. And so that's why we said the meditation, if you do TM, it's twice a day, ideally, and you, you twice, whether you feel like it or not, you just sit down and you throw off stress. And so you, you kind of restore your nervous system. And so it's, it's these, these, these three things. And there's concern that with all the electronic entertainment now, stimulation, that kids aren't having enough time just to, to, to mind wander. Because in addition to creativity and problem solving, it turns out that just having time to reflect on yourself is usually uh, important for the development of empathy. Mm-hmm. Because if I, if I say something, if I'm a kid and I said, say something hurtful to you today, and, and I see the way you react, I got to feel bad about it. I got to. I gotta need time to process it and think about it, um, uh, so I don't. I don't do. I realize how hurtful that was. And not do it again. 
But if you're constantly stimulated, you don't, you don't have that time for self-reflection. So mm-hmm. the radical downtime means downtime. It's not gardening. It's not playing music. It's, it's time where you're doing nothing. But you do it except for restoring, restoring yourself. Hmm. Yeah. And that for kids might look like maybe they're stacking blocks while they're thinking and daydreaming, or you think just yeah. they should be just. No, I, I, well, and the capacity, the capacity for being in your own head is, is, is really yeah. greatly diminished. And yeah. psychology, a lot of psychologists used to say, really, the, the, the most important thing for, for emotional maturity is, is, is the ability to be with yourself. You know, and, and I think that, um, you know, as you say, with that 60 hours without your phone, you know, the, the, uh, but, but being able to tolerate that. And we, we mentioned in the book that this, uh, this series of studies is done, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, where they asked college freshmen uh, to sit with their own thoughts for 15 minutes you know, with, uh, with, with no, nothing to read and nothing to listen to, so just in their own head for 15 minutes. And they were told that if you get bored, uh, you, 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 can, you can administer a, 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 a mild electric shock. And everybody in the study before the study started said, "No way would I would I give myself a shock." Something like sixty or seventy percent of the, the the young men in the study shocked themselves within six minutes. Wow, fifteen percent of the women. So it's it's harder now than it was to kind of sit with your own thoughts. I don't think that that, that building with Legos, for example, is 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 radical downtime, but but it's so crucial. It's and we and we, in our in our chapter in the self driven child. Where we talk about motivation, um, that uh, that we, we talk about the, re, the, the research of a guy named Reed Larson, who studied adoles- who studies adolescent development. And one of the things he studied was how do children turn into self motivated adolescents and adults. And the studies, it's the set, series of studies concluded it's not through dutifully doing your homework, it's through what he called passionate engagement in pastimes. A passionate pursuit of past pastimes, and starting with their, their little building with Legos, where they completely it's completely on their own. They're completely into it. They're really working hard at it, and what they're learning is a brain state that combines high focus, high energy, high high determination, but low stress because they aren't being forced to do it. They're doing their own their own choice, mm-hmm. and the idea was that that's the brain state that we want to be in most of the time as, as an adult. That we want to have that kind of self-motivated, passionate engagement in what we're doing, and, uh, and I this and it certainly just made sense to me as somebody who graduated from from high school with a C plus average, and I just didn't care that much about school. I, I, I but I was passionate about rock and roll. I was in a band, and I spent hours every night working on on rock, teach myself music and working plant, practicing my parts, and um, and I really think that I sculpted a brain. Through rock and roll, it was able to go pedal to the metal once school became more important to me. Hmm. I love that. And you talk a little bit in your book about how, you know, if a kid has a passion that they want to go really deep on, and that passion isn't necessarily math or writing, that let them do it. And it sounds like for you, music was that passion. That yeah, it was sports and then, then then later music. And then music is, I, I'm, I'm 72 years old. I still play in a rock band. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, it's, it's great. But, uh, but, um, but yeah, and I th- when I see and I see a lot of unmotivated kids. I see a lot of under, underachieving kids, and as long as they're passionate about something, and, and video games don't necessarily count. And, and I, 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 I'm generally hoping that something other than video games. I can explain the why. But if they're if they're involved in you know building, they're involved in in dance, art, music, coding, rock climbing, sports. I don't, I don't care what it is. But there's something where there there's something they love to do. Where they're working hard to get better and better and better at it, then I say I don't worry about you, because I know you're sculpting a brain that knows this brain state of high energy, high focus, high determination, high effort, but no, low stress. That and that's and, and I, I think it's you're eventually probably going to want to get an education, and I think you're. Gonna, but I know you're going to have a brain that once school becomes important to you, you're, you're going to be able to laser in and, and, and work hard at it. Yeah. 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 So you talked a little bit about TM. Um, my family and I got trained during the pandemic, kind of the beginning of the beginning of 2021, actually. And um, I admire that you said you have been 50 years, never missed a day, because it's still hard for me to be consistent. <laughs> um, but it's it is amazing, and I really enjoy it. But it is hard for me to be consistent. Well, I will say that I, I learned when I was 23 years old. 
I, I wasn't married. I didn't have kids. <laughs> I had a part-time job, you know. And I think it's, it's many most of the people I know have been married, have met, met him this long. They learn when they're you know they were much younger. They didn't have adult res- a, lot of, a lot of adult responsibilities, and, and so it's, it's easier. And, and, and life is more complicated, more fast-paced now. Uh, but you know, Ned. You know, for me, it was just life changing. I mean, I, I, flunked, I just flunked out of graduate school and because I was so anxious and insecure that at least people, I, I just, I just, I, I couldn't study because I, I couldn't, my, my, my prefrontal cortex was just overwhelmed by my stress response that I couldn't study for more than 10 minutes at a time. And I was so anxious and insecure, I didn't turn in any work because I was afraid of being judged negatively. And so I flunked out. And, and, and at least two or three people told me why, when I was, I was at the University of California, Berkeley at that time, that I was the most nervous person they've ever met. Oh, wow. And then, so I, and one of them said, if, if there's anybody in this planet that needs to learn to meditate, it's you. <laughs> so I, I went back home to Seattle with my tail between my legs, having never been more embarrassed and kind of scared about that. Now what do I do? Yeah. Um, and I learned TM. And within a, within a week, well, within a month, my foot stopped tapping unrelentingly. And also I, I developed a facial dip with this kind of grimace and, and that went away. And I found after a couple months, I could sit and read for a couple hours at a time as opposed to 12 minutes at a time without having to distract myself. Mm. After I was meditating for about two months, I was, work, I was just filling orders in a warehouse. And my foreman cornered me at, at, at a break and he said, what do you want? <laughs> and I thought I thought he's like, expecting me using some drugs. Yeah. He's going to turn me in or something. I, I said, "What are you talking about?" I said, "When you started here, you were the most nervous person I've ever met. Now you seem so calm." I thought, "Well," I, and I didn't always feel calm inside. But I thought, God, "This meditation must be doing something." Yeah. You know, and Ned, when we were lecturing about our new book, you know, Ned has often said that last summer they found out that his nineteen um, year old son had a brain tumor. And he got he got really effective treatment. He's doing really well. He's back in college, doing great. But it was hard. And his wife, apparently, who's been meditating for I think three or, three or four years, she said that that she was asked several times in the first couple of months, "How can you be so calm about this?" And she said, "It must be the medita- it must be the meditation." Hmm. And I know this family where they both the mother and her seventeen year old son with autism both both learned TM, and a newspaper reporter. Uh, did a story on them and asked the kid, what, 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 what do you notice from, from the meditation? <laughs> he says, TM calms the mind and it calms the mom. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you know, and I, in terms of the, this move in this direction of being a non-anxious presence, you know, where we're, we're yeah. and it, because you think about it, if, if, if you're, if you have it holding an infant and an infant is, 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 is crying and crying, it's a lot easier to soothe them if we stay calm. If you've got a three-year-old, you're in a store and a three-year-old's having a tantrum, it's a lot easier to deal with it if we can stay calm and we don't just start yelling or we don't start figuring out ourselves. If you've got a 15-year-old or your, your third grader comes home and she's the only girl in her friend group who didn't get invited to a party, it's more, we can be helpful most if we can stay calm and not not, not go and call the kid's mother and then complain. Yeah. And say, if you've got a 15-year-old coming home uh, who got whose girlfriend dumped him or he got cut from the basketball team, we can be most helpful to our kids if we if we can stay calm, and it's just it's a goal. I mean, not, you know, some people find it easier than others, but mm-hmm. this idea that this, so much of our work is on ourselves, and that, that ideally we move in this direction of being a non anxious presence, and, and um, so, so that we can for, for our family. About once a week, my eight year old asks me, "How's your mindfulness coming?" Or I think you need to do your <laughs> mindfulness today. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, I laugh about, but I also appreciate that. You know, I appreciate that he's he's watching me, you know, and he is so reactive to me and to my emotions. And I as I think most kids are, but I think he more than more than most is very sensitive yeah, to my emotions. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and by him asking me and checking in with me, it's this kind of like, I need you to be calm so I can be calm as I'm mirroring you. And I so it serves as a nice reminder to me yeah, when he yeah. when he checks in. Yeah. <laughs> There's a whole police department here in, in, in a suburb of uh, D.C. learned TM. And um, one, one of my friends who was a volunteer uh, policeman we, we went, went to this banquet. And, and the, the head of the police department said that, that she learned she, she practiced regularly for three or four months. Then she got busy and she wasn't as regular. And her daughter said, you, you're much better. <laughs> you're a much better mother when you meditate regularly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So true. Well, thank you so much, Bill. This has been amazing chatting with you today. I appreciate it. I really enjoyed it, Danae. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed my chat with Dr. Bill Sticksrude.
If you want to learn more about him, go to simplefamilies.com forward slash episode 331. You'll find all the links there. I appreciate you tuning in. I'm so glad you're here.